And I think that a lot of people are not being honest with themselves. And I guess I would have to say that POP is a place where we just have to get real with who we are and what we are. Um, I'm not a pastor, nor do I preach or teach uh, that you have to try to guess what I'm saying. I want you to walk out of here saying, I know exactly what that man said. Because it really challenges those that are on the fence trying to figure out which way to go. So I want to talk to you for a little while on this subject. Be honest. Be honest. Not long after a wealthy contractor had finished building the Tombs prison in New York, he was found guilty of forgery and sentenced to several years in the prison he had built. As he was escorted into the cell of his own making, the contractor said, I never dreamed when I built this prison that I would be an inmate one day. He thought he could outrun his deception, but truth caught up to him. A lack of honesty put him in prison that was built by his own hands. I simply want to say to all of you that if you're not honest, it will eventually put you in a prison built with your own hands. From denying, refuting, contradicting, snubbing, refusing, discarding, or even rejecting the truth will put you in prison. It doesn't matter what the politicians are saying. It doesn't matter what churches are saying. The truth is the truth, and the truth shall never fail, nor shall the truth ever be changed. It's unfortunate. Though, we're living in a generation that despises God. That is the truth. In fact, Solomon starts talking about this in Proverbs, the 30th chapter and the 14th verse. He said, there is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off of the earth and the needy from among men. He references this by stating that there's the poor and the needy that are being devoured. The poor and the needy that are being devoured. But let me propose to you that the poor and the needy are not those without money, but those without God. It's a generation that is trying to devour those that are searching for God or even to those that potentially are finding God. But not only that, they are looking to also destroy those that are living for God and even take away the rights of the church. And I would have to say it's truly a work of Satan. Jesus makes reference to this in John 8, 44. He says, ye are of a father, the devil, and the desires of your father ye will, ye will do... Um, Ye will to do, he was a manslayer from the beginning, and in the truth he hath not stood, because there is no truth in him. When one may speak the falsehood of his own, he speaketh because he is a liar and also a father of liars. Let me just say tonight or today that the enemy, which is Satan, is trying to recruit those in believing his lies. Oh, I just want to be honest here. They speak his lies and they say there's no God because he is their father. So in turn, they speak his words and not the word of God. Satan has no honesty in him. He speaks lies. 
Now listen to me very carefully because I've prayed over this, I've sought God over this, and I've turned this inside and out, and I really believe that I understand why we have a generation that no longer wants to live for God. And where is this coming from is found in just a few verses down in Proverbs, the 30th chapter and the 17th verse. It says, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. It's simply coming from those who despise the message of the last generation. Let me tell you, my mom and dad are here today, but there's something in them that I never want to lose. Because I know that the divine providence of God and the power of God is in them to hand to us the things that shall prevail in the future. If we ever fail to recognize that God is here, but He is also here to hand us the divine things that he has in store for us through the generation before us, then we come to a truth that says, no, this message is not old-fashioned. It's not out of date. <laughs> Can I preach on? It talks about how that the young eagle shall eat it and the ravens of the valley shall pick it out. It's simply saying about the eyes until their eyes are plucked out and they cannot see the truth. And that is the generation we're living in today that doesn't have anything or have any desire for God. Truth hurts. But for this generation, a lot of people in this generation, I'm not talking about everybody, but I'm talking the spirit of this generation. Truth hurts them more than they're willing to change. Obedience is no longer a virtue. Church is no longer valued. To them, God is no longer real. And so they are devoured and they cannot see. Mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa, great-grandparents don't know what they're talking about in this generation that Solomon is talking about. It's being said, even today, that God, church, and the Bible are old-fashioned. Those are his lies. They say things have changed now. No, that's the devil's lies. It's not like that anymore. Oh, yes, it is. That's just a lie of the enemy to try to convince you that God is not real and God cannot deliver you. So now, lifestyles have changed. Lifestyles have changed into this lustful desire because conviction has been thrown out the door, but that's the devil's lies. Minds, thoughts, and truth have become sterile and been replaced with hate, harm, and division because of the enemy's lies. It amazes me how they uh, get you addicted to drugs to get you off drugs. And it's all just a mess. And unfortunately... They're not being honest with themselves because they're believing in the lies of Satan. Now, I didn't say it was going to be easy come to church day. I didn't say there wasn't going to be conviction here. My assignment today is to do my best to shake you out of your complacency and get you to recognize and realize that either you live for God and believe the truth with all of your heart and understand that there is no other way other than the way of Jesus Christ or you're going to go ahead and believe the father of the world which is his lies and you'll walk away from this. I just want you to understand there is still a line drawn in the sand and there's still a God in heaven and there's still one that wants to deliver you and there's still a God that wants to give you a true deliverance of your life. That's why when the scripture says, Be, beware, when you drink from wells you never dug, and you eat from vineyards you never planted. He's simply saying, be careful because you're eating and drinking from the labor of a generation before you. 
And that generation was blessed by God. So don't take that blessing and throw it away on the enemy's lies. Prayer still works. Fasting still works. The gift of the Holy Ghost still works. The plan of salvation and the doctrine of this great church truth of, that Jesus Christ is God still works. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Be careful. When you're living in mom and dad's house that you've never labored for something on your own. Be careful when you always have to hang on to mom and dad's insurance because you can't afford your own. I'm talking about a generation that's losing sight and the things that are important that cause us to be independent and realize we're making our own choices. But if you can't even make a living for yourself, you'll believe the lies of the world and always ask the world to give you something. It's a handout. It's entitlement that says, I can't do this on my own, so I need somebody else to help me. No, go out, get a job, work, pray, fast, get in touch with God, and realize that God is always going to bless those that put their hand to the things of his word. Be careful. Be careful. I just want to say that parents, God didn't give you those children to live with you for the rest of your life. He gave you those children that when you get old, they'll support you. You took care of them. You clothe them. Am I talking to anybody today? You clothe them. You put foot in their stomach. You wipe their hineys and got the drool out of their mouth. Now it's time for them to grow up. And our little ladies need to become ladies and our men need to become men. I'm talking now. You know, I may not have you afraid, but the devil's afraid right now. You might be all right, but the devil's afraid of what's going to happen next before this service is over. Because some of you are going to get a revelation of what I'm talking about. And before this day's over, there's going to be a paradigm shift in your life. And you're going to start making changes that are going to, to give way to your future. I got to talk on this a little while. When I look at all this, I want to be honest with you and transparent that my peace is challenged and my spirit is troubled. But this is not about just doom and gloom today. Let me talk about the other side. Before creation, God set in motion that light always wins against darkness. Now, Brother Flores, you almost got all my stuff today. And I was about ready to have to sit you down. <laughs> because in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the second verse, it says, And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters he's simply saying darkness has no form and it's void meaning darkness is nothing if we want to talk about Satan for a while let me just make it very clear he is nothing Some of us are giving too much credit to the nothing. 
Some of us are giving too much credit to the things that has no form and no void and there's no truth in it. But God says, I want to breathe light into your life because light always, always removes darkness. I I just wish somebody here with your pastor's preaching. I don't care how long you've done drugs. I don't care what you've done in your life and all the issues that you've come into and the sin that you've committed. Once you get Jesus Christ into your life then darkness has to flee. It can no longer stay there. Amen. Don't tell me you've got Jesus in you if darkness is not fleeing. No. When Jesus comes in. I said when Jesus comes in. I said when Jesus comes in. Not when the church, not when the pastor, not when the saints, but when Jesus comes in. Darkness must flee. Somebody shout hallelujah. Then he says in the third verse, and God said, let There be light. What's the next next portion I say? And there was light. Let me just make it very clear. Darkness is nothing. So darkness is the absence of light. Light has to be removed. For darkness to even be noticed. When light is absent, form and void is present. Nothing is there unless you allow it to be there. It is nothing. It is nothing. That's why the devil is a liar because no truth is in it. Therefore, only darkness is present. But when God breathes, when God speaks, he steps into darkness and says, you no longer reside in this place because light is present. Well, you can say, well, Brother Bib, this is all Old Testament uh, teaching. But let me just, let me bring it to you in the New Testament. We pick it up again in the New Testament in John 1, 5. And it says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness, what? Comprehended it not. Now for you to really understand this, let me put it in context because we got to go back to the first verse of John to really understand what this is saying. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, what? Was God. So we know now that the Word is God. And God is the Word. Then he says in the second verse, the same was in the beginning with God. Third verse, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now this is referring to creation. But the next verse is where it turns into something more and greater than just the light of creation. He then says in the fourth verse, just as it was in creation, now it shall be unto you. In him was life, and the life was the light. The light of what? Men. Now he's saying this is not just about 4,000 years earlier. Where he said, let there be light. But now he's talking about you and I. And he says, any man and any woman that has light in them, darkness cannot comprehend it. This is the light that is in our lives. Then we go to the fifth verse. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He's simply making it very clear that when you know him, when you know him, when you know him, darkness cannot overthrow you. 
It cannot defeat the revelation and the knowledge of God. The Spirit of God is greater than the darkness of this world. Am I talking to anybody? Do you understand that what I'm saying is when you know Him and you get this Jesus Christ for yourself, there is not a devil out of hell. There is not a politician from Congress. There's not anyone that is in this world a family member. There is nothing that can dissuade you and take you a different direction. When you have your mind made up that I know who this Jesus is. I'm going to tell you there's nothing. There's nobody. There's not a friend. There's not a wife. There's not a husband that's going to deter you. You're going to say I know in Jesus and I know in whom I serve. And there is nothing going to take me away from my God. I wonder if I've got just a few people here today that would stand to your feet and declare that I know who this God is. I know this Jesus Christ. I know him for myself. Hallelujah. I know him for myself. I know this God. I know him for myself. Amen. This is why you need to move out of your home and get respons- and be responsible for yourself so you can know him for yourself. Amen. And that you know that my responsibilities lead up to my knowing this Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Uh, From that fifth verse, the question now is poised, how do we get this light? Well, just go down a little further to the 14th verse. And that word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Through the word. Through the word. That was made flesh in Jesus Christ is how you get the light. I'm telling you, I'm so troubled in my spirit when I hear people say that baptism is no longer important. I am troubled in my spirit when someone comes and tells me that it's in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost with your titles when they don't even understand that scripture in the first place. And they think they do because they're believing a lie rather than understanding the revelation of that word. I'm troubled by this. I'm troubled by those that are believing the father of the world rather than believing the word of God. Why am I troubled by it? I'll tell you why I'm troubled about it. Because the devil's taken so many to hell. And there's a generation that needs to hear this kind of preaching. They need to hear someone stand up and declare that God is still alive and God is still real and God still works and he still saves today oh I'm about ready to get the Holy Ghost again today amen I'm about ready to get the Holy Ghost amen I said to my brother today I said I I think I'm going to get the Holy Ghost today I'm troubled by this let me just explain why I'm troubled by this everything that has to do with revelation Satan hates When you get a revelation of who Jesus is, he then begins to work against you. The ironic thing is that I have been raised for so long that once you get the Spirit of God, everything gets easy. I I beg to differ with you that when you start living for God, you never knew what it was to fight a devil. Mm. And I'm troubled by this because the plan of salvation, the plan of salvation, the plan of salvation is being diluted to the ideology of the lies that the world is creating. 
I will tell you very strongly with everything that's in me that there's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Does anybody know that name? Does anybody believe that name? Come on, say the name. Say the name. Say the name. Who died for us? Who rose from the dead for us? Now I'm going to break it down. Then if it's Jesus who died, and it was Jesus that was buried, and if it was Jesus that rose from the dead, and through his spirit it was Jesus that showed up on the day of Pentecost, then who am I to change the plan of salvation to fit the comfort of the people? But my responsibility is to make sure I preach this truth without compromise and without favor. That I stand here and tell you that the only way you can be saved is through Jesus Christ. The world is tired of religion. They're tired of weak pastors standing in pulpits that listen to the people and not to God. They're looking for the truth to be revealed and that they can see the great revelation of God in their own personal lives. Um, I got this devil on his knees. Not only on his knees, I got him in a half Nelson. And he's begging for mercy. Who was it that died? Who was it was buried? Who was it that rose from the dead? And why did we have an experience on the day of Pentecost? Because of who? Now, this is why I want to just break it down. Number one, if Jesus died for us, then we must also die with him. That's why this church still preaches repentance. I think it's good for someone to get out of their chair and walk down to the altar, signifying and showing some effort to say, Lord, please forgive me. Now I'm going to buckle my knee at an altar because at the altar is where I have to sacrifice my sins because there was always a sacrifice at the altar. We must die with Christ. That's why the Bible says pick up your cross and follow him. Don't keep carrying your cross. Some of you still carrying it for 20 years. You need to drop the cross and lay down on that thing. And die. Die. Die to what? Died to selfishness, died to lust, died to lies, died to drugs, died to broken homes and broken marriages to say, God, this is going to die today. The second thing is what really gets me. This is where I wanted to go today. This is what ruffles my spiritual feathers. Almost makes me want to be like Jesus. Throw over the money chambers. Because someone just recently had said to me that they don't believe baptism is essential to salvation. Ah, that's a lie that's coming from the enemy. Baptism is as important as it's ever been. Jesus even shows that before he dies. He shows us when John the Baptist was with him, he said, baptize me. And John said, how can I do that? I'm, I'm not qualified. And Jesus said, baptize me so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. That word righteousness means right and justness. Right and just. Jesus was saying it's right and it's just for all flesh to be buried in baptism. So if Jesus was buried, you must be buried. Who died for you? Jesus. Who was buried for you? Jesus. Don't tell me. Don't tell me that 
that's not important. My assignment is here today to tell you anybody that preaches this any other way is a robber of the things of God. They're lying to you. And now they're allowing darkness to reside in the messages that are being preached. Nicole, I was going to anyway. I didn't, I didn't need your permission here today. I, I might have asked earlier in my ministry, but today I don't need your permission. Okay. I love that girl. We must die. I am here to tell you that all of us it doesn't matter if you've been raised in the church. It doesn't matter if you're the pastor or on the ministerial staff. All of us, you must go through the same process of the death, burial, and the resurrection. Some are trying to take the Spirit of God out of the equation. Until all they're saying, all you need to do is say, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and think they're saved without action. But he said, no, 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 no. Don't you believe that? I came that I might have light in you, light in you, light in you. And when I can get my light in you through the spirit, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door and allow the light to come in, I will sup with him and he with me. And he says, if you'll open the door, Jesus walks in and says, no more darkness can live in this temple for your body is the temple of God. He says, no longer can darkness live there, Freddie. Darkness has to go because when Jesus comes in he says it's time for a house cleaning and it's time for you to be delivered and it's time for you to come out of your darkness into his marvelous light uh. mm. man I feel the Holy Ghost today I think the ministerial staff going to be saved before this is over hmm uh, I don't know why I'm on this. I've been out of state for a while, so I'm giving everybody a hard time. Second Corinthians 4, chapter 6, verse says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge, everybody say knowledge, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. need to be honest and not pretend nor play church during one of his political campaigns a delegation called on Theodore Roosevelt at his home in Oyster Bay that was in Long Island The president met them with his coat off, his sleeves rolled up. He said, oh, gentlemen, he said, come down to the barn and we'll talk while I do some work. At the barn, Roosevelt picked up a pitchfork and looked around for the hay. Then he called out, John, where's all the hay? Sorry, sir. John called down from the hayloft. I ain't had time to toss it back down after you pitched it up here while the Iowa folks were here. He was pretending to be a working man. He was pretending to be a working man in front of the people. But he got caught simply being a politician. He wasn't being honest. He wasn't doing work at all. He just walked into the barn, put that pick in the hay and throw it up on the hayloft. Then when he walked out, John would throw it back down so it just looked like he had something to do every time he walked into the barn. He was trying to convince 
the delegation that he was a working man, but in turn, he found him to be nothing more than a politician. If you're going to find Jesus, you not only have to be real with people, but you need to be real with yourself. In conclusion of this message, Jesus was passionate through Jericho, and a man by the name of Zacchaeus was there. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax gatherer, and he was rich. But he was a little man. He wanted to see Jesus for himself. He was a little man. So he ran ahead and found himself a sycamore tree and he climbed up into that sycamore tree. He ran ahead of the crowd. When he ran up into that sycamore tree, Jesus noticed him. Pause for a moment and say, you and Zacchaeus right now are sitting in the sycamore tree here you are you and I we're in the sycamore tree and Jesus is passing our way the real question is when Jesus said in Luke 19 9 the L the YLT version said today salvation did come to this house in as much as he also is the son of Abraham this point When salvation came to him, are you willing to get down so that Jesus can come into your house and bring light? Because everything I've preached so far is not going to do a bit of good unless you're willing to get out of your sycamore tree. It's not going to do you a bit of good until you're willing to hear the summons and the call of Jesus Christ. He says, Zacchaeus, This day is the day I'm coming into your house. Notice that scripture. Into your house was more a reference to him as a person than it was just going to his house. As we stand, they're getting ready to sing. My question to you is, are you willing to get out of your sycamore tree? What we do here at POP is we gather around these altars. Some people kneel. Some people are up here by the stairs and they kneel down by the stairs or even up here by the pulpit. And some stand. Some get on the floor. And they kneel on the floor and put their face toward the ground. Simply showing a humble and a contrite spirit before God. It doesn't matter how you come. It just matters whether or not you're willing to get out of your sycamore tree. Be honest. Come on. Be honest. Be honest. Be honest. Come on. Come on. Be honest.